a second, one millimeter, one percent. It is no doubt that all of these are small values. No one would argue otherwise. But it would be a grave mistake to assume that these small values have equally small implications. Each of these values alone can alter outcomes, a win or a loss, life or death, or even our very understanding and perception of space and time. Now, why am I telling you this? Certainly, I am not giving you a lecture on quantum theory or astrophysics. But the takeaway is that the very small affect the very large, and in a much grander scale than we can even imagine, the two are deeply intertwined. It's because small units are important in everything. Yes, even in our very own game of Yu-Gi-Oh! What is the value that we are looking at today, then? Well, it's none other than the number 50. Welcome to the History of Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Fox here, and in this episode, we will cover the era from February to March 2003. Now, Labyrinth of Nightmare was a very special set for me. Its release is what stands out most in my mind in this era for some reason. Maybe it's because I had some of the spoilers from the set even before it was released, and I'd have to thank this issue of a magazine called Beckett for that. It talked about a card called Gemini Elf, and that was the only card that I really, really wanted to pull from this set. Funny thing is that I never did pull a Gemini Elf, and even to this day, I still don't own one. I guess I should probably get one someday for nostalgia's sake, but that's off topic. For now, let's quickly go over some of these set releases in this era. I haven't talked about video game releases much throughout this series at all, except for the brief mention of Dungeon Dice Monsters in the previous episode, but here I'll mention Duels of the Roses just because it has some interesting promo cards. On February 16, 2003, the video game Duelist of the Roses was released. The promo cards that came with the game were Alpha, Beta, and Gamma the Magnet Warrior, which aren't too notable as meta cards, but the game itself was quite interesting and rather complex in terms of its playstyle and very different from the real game that we were playing. So if you guys do want to try it, I do suggest you go and grab yourself a copy from your local used game store. It might be an interesting trip down nostalgia lane. It shouldn't cost more than $20 now and may be worth your time. I mean, hey, you're already watching the history of Yu-Gi-Oh, right? So might as well get into the spirit. Now moving on to the meat of the format, we have the main booster set, Labyrinth of Nightmare. On March 1st, 2003, right smack dab in the middle of the format, Labyrinth of Nightmare was released. This was a major set for the game and had a significant impact on it. Most notable of all, of course, was Gemini Elf, which instantly power creeped what it meant to be a level 4 beat stick. Without any sort of warning, Mechanical Chaser was instantly tossed to the side, only to be used as a somewhat more budget version of Gemini Elf. Funny how back in this era, power creep in order to sell sets was done simply by slapping on 50 more attack points, when nowadays, I don't even think that a 2500 attack 4 star vanilla would be that broken at all if it didn't have a useful name or type and attribute. Released at the same time on March 1st, 2003, was Tournament Pack 3rd Season. For the third wave of prize pack support, it was overall still pretty lackluster with almost nothing new at all that was of worth. Mechanical Chaser could be obtained from it still, but like I said before, its arrow is already over. There were a couple of other good staples, but outside of that, the only interesting card in this set was Needleworm. On March 30th, 2003, Starter Deck Joey and Pegasus were released. These two came out right as the format was eclipsing away, so to be honest, in terms of meta impact, technically for this format, they had zero effect coming out basically one day before the ban list. But the powerful cards found within them would most certainly morph the game moving forward. I'll cover these decks here, but in the next episode we'll have a quick recap of them as well because they'll be pretty influential. With these out of the way, let's move on and talk about the ban list for this format. The February 2003 ban list came out only a mere two months after the previous one, and this was the fifth ban list in the game and the first list to move a previously limited card up to unlimited. It was a smaller list than we have seen previously before though, likely due to the fact that it occurred so close to the December list that came right before it, that there just weren't many changes that needed to be made at all, 
and also there weren't that many cards released in that time period. For Forbidden, we still have nothing. And then limited cards, we have Sinister Serpent, Harpy's Feather Duster, and Heavy Storm. Sinister Serpent is one of those wonky hits that you see from this old era when the game's management was still being split between UDE and Konami. Why is that? Well, if you watch this series up until now, you will notice that I have never even mentioned Sinister Serpent yet, and somehow it has become limited. That's right, it was limited before its release in the TCG. It wouldn't even be released until two months later as a promo with Stairway to the Destined Duels. I guess that's why I needed to mention the video games. Some of them actually have important cards. Like, really, really important cards. Anyways, moving to the other limited cards, we see Heavy Storm and Feather Duster getting limited. There isn't much explanation here. Costless massive back row removal was still very powerful in that day and age. To this day, these cards remain as the most hotly debated cards on the ban list. Now, moving on to the semi-limited section, we have Graceful Charity. Graceful Charity, surprise surprise, is another card not yet released in the TCG. It would not be released until another two months later in Starter Deck Pegasus. Q Rant I just never understood this part of the management of the early game. If cards are going to be hit on the ban list, which is controlled by Konami, I imagine they have at least some sort of control as to what cards will come to the TCG. After all, UDE was just technically a distributor. It just makes no sense to me how things like this were dealt with. At the very least, cards that were hit on the list should have been released by the start of that format. Not a month later, not two months later. It doesn't even make sense for cards not out yet to be hit on the list. <sighs> or, you know what? They could have separated the ban list as they do now. But whatever. End rant. Let's get back to the February 2003 ban list and finish this thing up. For the unlimited section, we see Nobleman of Krasa and Swords of Revealing Light moving back up to unlimited. Nobleman at this point was a good card, but not worthy of seeing hits on the ban list at all. As for Swords of Revealing Light, well, like I said in the last episode, just watch out for its ban list movement. It's a traveler of the ban list for sure. This pretty much wraps up the ban list changes for this format. Now we move on to the staple cards coming out of the sets at this point in time. We'll take a look at the cards released from Labyrinth of Nightmare, the main booster set of this era, starting with the monsters. First up we have Gemini Elf. She, or should I say they, were the chase card of this set for sure, sporting a whopping 1900 attack, giving her a precise 50 point edge on Mechanical Chaser that rendered him more obsolete than a CD player once MP3 players came out. 1900 was the new standard of the game in terms of offense, and there was no other match for Gemini Elf. Either you had to go and shell out the cash for this card, or you had to deal with it in other ways. Dark Elf was still a good option if you wanted to just muscle your way over these twin elves. There was another option for you though that actually came out in this set as well, but I'll mention that card a little bit later on. Or you could also go for the raw power of Goblin Attack Force. Of course, there was also other options with the ubiquitous plethora of monster removal spells. Either way though, Gemini Elf was a massive offensive pressure tool that forced a response from your opponent, either through spells or monsters. Next up we have Dark Necrofear. Scary and creepy as she may be, this card barely even scratched the meta at all. She's more of a notable card, but the fact that Bakura used her made her presence seen in many many decks across locals and even larger tournaments. To be fair, her effect was not bad at all, actually offering up herself as a nice special summon monster that could even be done turn 1 easily when combined with a card like Painful Choice. The Snatch Steal effect on her destruction is actually decisively useful, as you would want to take control of whatever was able to kill her. Even if she was destroyed from Fisher, granted that some other monster was on your opponent's side of the field, she could still take control of it. On a side note, I actually managed to acquire one of these pretty cards way back in March 2003. I want to say I was pretty proud of that. It took a nice trade on my part of my Legend of Blue Eyes Guy of the Fierce Knight and a Curse of the Mass Beast from this set, but it was oh so worth it. At least at the time anyways. Looking back, I think I would have rather had the Gaia. But hindsight is 2020. Anyways, on to the next card. Zambira the Dark. This was a card that I was talking about before. As a common, Zambira was easily pulled 
and offered poor budget players the opportunity to fight back against Gemini Elf. While it had many restrictions on it as a level 4 monster with 2100 attack, they were in no way such large hindrances as to render him unplayable. He served his role well as the Elf Killer. At 2100 attack, he could run over Gemini Elf and then his effect would kick in, bringing him down to 1900 attack, at which he could still crash in with another copy of Gemini Elf. That's my definition of card economy right there. Very solid monster through and through. Next we have the spirits. In Labyrinth of Nightmare, we were given the four attribute spirits. One of the first attempts at attribute support after the searchers like Giant Rat and Mystic Tomato that we saw back in Magic Ruler. Although these were limited to the four classical elements of water, earth, air, and fire. Wait, did I say air? Sorry, I meant wind. Wind. Like, you know, Konami's favorite attribute. Anyways, these four cards offered some more neat ways to special summon that haven't really been seen in the game before. To be honest though, they weren't used very much back in the day, but Aqua Spirit at least has popped up from time to time in Mermail and Necroz as rank 4 fodder. Bazoo the Soul Eater Now this card was the man back in the day. Basically, if you summoned him sometime around mid-game, he'd be a level 4 monster with 2500 attack. Move over, Gemini Elf, because this bear beast thing is going to eat your soul. Oh, and of course, I cannot forget to mention the fact that upon his printing, Bazoo was even more amazing than he should have been. Yes, yes, all of this was due to a little thing called translation error. It never ceases to amaze me how these translation issues continue even to this day. If you don't believe me, look at the recent Performopal Pendulum Sorcerer errata. That happened literally a few weeks ago. I guess that's what happens when the mother game is Japanese and it has to be translated to other languages. I think Yu-Gi-Oh has officially printed it in at least 9 or 10 languages. There are some worse translations though, like Portuguese Virgil. I'm not kidding. I don't know any Portuguese, so excuse me, but his name was translated as follows. Virgil a Estrela de Pedra do Abismo Ardente, which literally means Star of Rock of the Burning Abyss. Like the physical things, stars in the sky and rocks on the ground. Yeah, good job Konami. Anyways, I've digressed well off track of Bazoo. Bazoo's mistranslation was the fact that for his effect, you could banish any card in your graveyard rather than what it was supposed to be, which was only monsters. This made the card way easier to boost up to 2500 attack, as spells and traps were mostly useless in the graveyard anyways. I know Mask of Darkness and Magician of Faith existed, but still, you get my drift. You were better off giving them up as food to this guy. And it's actually gone under a lot of erratas. Six in fact. Which is kind of crazy considering that his effect is pretty simple. I probably spent too much time talking about Bazoo. Anyways, he's a big bear, and he has a big bite. Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer. Move over La Jin and other monsters of the 1800 attack club. We have a new priest in town, and he brought some prayer beads to deal with all of your grave antics. Kaiku, of course, was a beat stick, but he served a purpose that was much more important than that. Remember Bazoo that we just talked about? Well, Kaiku had a similar mistranslation that allowed him to banish any cards from your opponent's grave when he inflicted battle damage. And I think you can guess what Kaiku's purpose was now pretty easily. He was the counter to the big soul eater. With him out, he could not only keep your opponent's grave empty of some soul food for Bazoo, but also, he halted Bazoo in his tracks. Bazoo could do nothing to a Kaiku that was already on the field, as his second effect prevented your opponent from banishing cards in their grave, which meant that Bazoo's 1600 attack was no match at all for Kaiku's 1800. Now we move on to the spells. We'll cover Mage Power and United We Stand Together because they're similar in concept and execution. These cards offer a nice boost to your monsters, and at maximum power each offers a boost of 2500 attack, which is the highest of any single equip card we have seen as of yet. At the release of Labyrinth of Nightmare, Mage Power is better than United We Stand for nearly this whole era all the way until the last day when Starter Deck Joey was released on March 30th. A single card in the deck, Scapegoat, changed everything for United We Stand making it an instant 2 card combo that boosted any monster's attack by 2500. Not truly game breaking, but it was a cheesy combo for sure. 
An interesting car that these two resurrected from Pharaoh's servant, though, was Hayabusa Knight, a pitiful monster with 1,000 attack that could attack twice. Combining with the power that these equips gave you though, and you could have a 2500 attack double attacker. Once again, I must remind you that this was 2003 we're talking about. Cyber Twin Dragon coming back into 2003 would be like taking an AK-47 and taking it back in time into the Middle Ages. Moving right along, we take a look at the trap cards. The first of which was Jar of Greed. In the slower formats of these old days, cards like Jar of Greed were actually decent in nearly all decks. The fact that it was chainable made it also good bait for removal, like MST. However, a major downside was the fact that the lack of any sort of true combos made Jar not as good as it could have been. It was definitely a huge boost for Exodia decks though. Torrential Tribute This is clearly a devastating card that persists even to this day as it sits at 1 on our current ban list. Essentially dark hole in trap form, its reactive nature nearly makes it better than the original itself. However, as both dark hole and Raigeki were legal at the time, it didn't really find a spot in too many decks, with the aforementioned spells being better overall picks. Spamming the board was still unheard of as of yet, and as a result, a reactive trap like Torrential was a tad slower than the spells. But Torrential is still a fiercely powerful card that can easily catch people off guard as it continues to do so to this day. When people pendulum 5 and get hit with the torrential these days, they tend to get a tad salty. But speaking of salt, it brings us to the last card from this set, a card that brings out the most salt of all. Magic Cylinder One of the trolliest of trap cards I would say to date, Magic Cylinder was a staple card of the protagonist Yugi and players went wild over it, whether it deserves it or not. To be honest, Cylinder was far inferior to Mirror Force and was rather lackluster with a relatively low amount of damage potential in this early era. Despite that though, this card made for excellent trade bait and was definitely a good card. In some ways, it made Stallburn more of a reality, although only marginally so. Burn was still far and away a terrible alternative win condition. And well, the only other one that existed was Exodia. Well, actually, Labyrinth of Nightmare changed this as well with the introduction of Destiny Board. Although even in these early days, it was never all that great. That rounds out the staples from Labyrinth of Nightmare. Now we move on to the Tournament Pack 3rd Season, where the only good card that came out of this was Needleworm. This was the only notable new card from this set, and it was the first step towards making Mill a reality. Now, Mill was still quite a ways away from being a true deck, but with the Morphing Jars and alongside this new Needleworm, Mill was growing more and more into a threat. As for our last new releases, we have Starter Deck Joey and Starter Deck Pegasus. Everything in these two starter decks were reprints except for 5 cards, so I might as well talk about all of the cards. First up we have Penguin Soldier. This card wasn't used much outside of some more troll decks, but it's not a bad card at all. It superseded Hain Hain with its printing though. I always liked the card too as I had an OCG one that my friend gave to me way early on in the game. I want to say I had it around 2002 when Yu-Gi-Oh was just getting popular in the United States. Our next card is Scapegoat. This card is a staple of Joey's. Now this card would eventually come to change the face of the game as we know it, but I don't think anyone would realize these implications for quite some time. Although most did acknowledge its power and versatility, as it could block 4 attacks and even act offensively by boosting a monster equipped with United We Stand as I mentioned previously. This card would see action on the ban list for a long time and was only recently fully released to the unlimited section. Moving on to starter deck Pegasus, we have Toon Alligator. This card was just an OCG import made for starter deck Pegasus that fit his theme of Toon Monsters I guess, except for the fact that well, this card isn't even a Toon Monster. You think I'm joking about this? OCG actually has a ruling on it if you want to look it up. But I assure you, Toon Alligator is not a Toon. Moving on, we have Griffin Wing. This card was laughably bad, even back then. Maybe it could have been 0.1% more useful had it been released maybe one format earlier when Feather Duster was at 2, but even then, this card was bad and belongs with its brethren trap cards like White Hole and Anti-Regeki. 
As always, we say the best for last. Graceful Charity. Well, well. I don't think this card needs much introduction. Draw 3, Pitch 2. Simply an amazing card that was limited on the ban list two months before its release. With good reason for sure. Had it been at 3, I'll bet Exodia would have had a field day. That essentially sums up all of the staple cards. Now we move on to take a quick look at some notable cards. We have Jowin the Spiritualist, Last Warrior from Another Planet, Card of Safe Return, Fusion Gate, Baked Doll, Spiritualism, Destiny Board, Mask of Restrict, and Skull Lair. And for the last segment, we have the Meta Dex. For the Meta Dex this time around and going forward, I think in order to be truer to the history and more accurately portray the game as it was, I'm going to be taking actual deck lists from events. In the past, this was extremely difficult to do as 2002 was sorely lacking in information. As a result, I had to use the power of hindsight to construct some uber versions of decks in that format. But I felt that did not actually show you all what the game was like back in this time, and I was erroneously showing you highly romanticized builds. Around this time, and up until early 2004 even, most players' decks were hardly optimized. There were many reasons for this, partially because of the game being incredibly young and players not knowing what to optimize, but also because a lot of the players were still very young at the time. The game was, surprise surprise, a children's card game after all. We all know now that it has evolved much farther beyond that though, but I did in fact start the game way back when as a child. Long story short, from here on out, we can take a look at actual deck lists that were used during this time. I think this is the best way to understand the game over a decade ago. Not everyone had access to every card, and deck lists and net decking were hardly commonplace. The internet was still booming. Thus, we have a unique situation where builds are wacky and all over the place, but that simply adds to the charm of this era in my opinion. Now without further ado, let's take a look at our first deck list. This first deck is called Ultimate Beatdown, piloted by Brian K. Starting off, we have raw, pure aggression in the form of a deck. We see some familiar faces returning here from decks you may have seen in my previous episodes. Classics like La Jin and Seven Colored Fish make a return here alongside a card from Tournament Pack's second season that I glossed over due to having been power creep already by that point in time. That card was Giant Red Sea Snake, who was in essence another 1800 attack beat stick, which was already semi-obsolete to the existence of Mechanical Chaser. This brings me to the next point about the deck though. The lack of Mechanical Chasers is definitely something that can be approved upon with the optimization of the deck, but overall this was a vast improvement in the beatdown strategy with the use of Ultimate Offering to span the field. He reported several near OTKs which to me is insane to consider during this era. His deck found decent success as from his tournament report he went 5-0 in all of his matches, dropping only a single game to a relinquished deck. And with that, I'd like to move on to our next deck. Here we have another player with a very aggressive deck. This is Adrian's deck here, a Maha Velo beatdown deck. Something I also like to call the Hipster Ben K Turbo. Maha Velo holds a special place in my heart, and it was one of my favorite cards when I was younger. The art itself carries that classic Yu-Gi-Oh feel within it even to this day. Adrian's deck served him well, taking him 5-0 in his local tournament as well, only dropping a single game. The deck's strategy is pretty simple. Summon big monsters to run over things and get direct damage in when you can. He ran a lot of monster removal, likely to capitalize upon his high damage potential. There are some changes that could be made, obviously, by replacing the generic 1800s with Gemini Elves, as well as the possible inclusion of either United We Stand or Mage Power. Whether this was a tech choice to not include these combo-reliant cards, or it may have been a cost-based decision, I don't know, but Mage Power at least seems suitable enough in this deck to power up Mahavela with. Although the reliance on other cards may have made the immediate guaranteed boost from Acts of Despair more appealing to Adrian. What's unique to note though is that Maha Velo with 1550 attack equipped with an Axe of Despair could actually run over Blue-Eyes White Dragon. That's impressive. 
but it's not like there were many blue eyes white dragons running around anyways. Surely not as many as we'll have in the near future once these new blue eyes cards come to the TCG. But I'm drifting away from the point of this discussion. Adrian's Maavelo deck proved to be a worthy contender back in the day, and it did so simply by overpowering whatever was thrown at it, even things running massive beat sticks themselves, because Maavelo just could become so, so powerful. Now let's move on to the next deck. You guys may be surprised, but the roots of Clown Control actually stem from this format. What's unique about this deck, in my opinion, is that it's one of the first true control decks in the sense that it had a specified goal via the clowns. The only other real control decks were just term control because they ran Jinzo and Imperial Order, but realistically, they were just beatdown decks that added the powerful control cards in as tech. This deck, on the other hand, is based on the concept of control through and through, opting not to run any sort of innate beat stick whatsoever. This is kind of a first in a way, because almost every single deck would blindly be able to benefit from just tossing in strong monsters. But in the way that this deck functions, oftentimes the setup is better without having the powerful monsters, because they might just end up hindering you just looking at the strategy of this deck. Now Ron played this deck in a 40 person tournament in Tucson, Arizona way back on February 15, 2003. That was well over 13 years ago to save you guys the math. Old as this deck may be, it was pure genius in how it countered aggressive strategies that were dime a dozen at the time, using the power of gravity bind as well as the controlling aspects of the two clowns. And lastly, we have an Exodia deck to wrap it up. Now, is this deck all that good? No, so fair warning. Exodia in general, was it good in this format? No, not at all either. But was this build that I'm showing you unique in any way? Maybe, but in all honesty, it's pretty terrible. In a way though, this is kind of the charm and allure of this era. Most decks were pretty terribly built still, and this was no exception. A lot of odd tech choices were found here and there, from the Bistro Butcher with a single appropriate, to the plethora of defensive walls as stall cards. What's funny is that our duelist here, despite poor optimization of the deck, actually found himself some minor success with it. He wasn't completely crippled by a card destruction, as he had Backup Soldier, and the 2000 defense wall still could shrug off Gemini Elf, which was the major threat of this format. Interestingly enough, he pulled off some fantastically crazy combos that won him a few duels in the tournament he played, namely the combo using Painful Choice and Backup Soldier to nab three free Exodia pieces from the deck. The funny part was that this put the opponent in a sort of catch-22 situation, as they could choose to add the piece to your hand, but that would just play into their own game, forcing a difficult decision on the opponent, trying to read whether or not you had the backup soldier or not. Ultimately, our young duelist Jeff did end up doing pretty poorly at the event, going 1-3, but despite that, I decided to show off this deck regardless as a quaint reminder of the rift in time between old Yu-Gi-Oh and new Yu-Gi-Oh. Of course, New Yu-Gi-Oh, in my opinion, technically wouldn't really start until somewhere in the GX era, so I'm getting ahead of myself, but you guys can kind of understand. If I wanted to be more specific, I suppose I could term this ancient Yu-Gi-Oh in the time before a defined meta and before net decking and optimization were real things. That wouldn't come until maybe early 2004. Going back to Exodia though, I feel like you guys might be wondering, was this deck ever good? Competitively, within the time of the competitive game, no, not really. There were many, many times though where the deck would hinge on the cusp of the meta, but it was never truly a central threatening deck. However, having played tons of GOAT control, in hindsight, I can see that Exodia was likely at its strongest point in the GOAT format era. You could run the Manticore loop, which could net you the instant win once set up very easily. But what am I doing? That's a year or two in the future. I can't spoil all my future episodes for you. And with that, I leave you the conclusion of the episode.
Before I conclude the episode, I know a lot of you are wondering why this episode took so long. I know I had most of this episode written up and actually about half of it recorded prior to January, but I know most of you don't know this about me, but I'm actually a medical student and I have my board medical licensing exam soon in a few weeks, and so that's why I haven't been able to work on this as much as I would have liked to because I've been trying to study in the previous few months as well as trying to keep up with my classes as well. Additionally, in these next few weeks leading up until my medical licensing exam date, my channel is probably going to slow down a lot and so please just bear with me. But by no means is the channel going to end or is History of Yu-Gi-Oh going to end. So don't worry about that. Don't ask if History of Yu-Gi-Oh is going to end because it's not going to end until the game itself ends. I'll keep up, although at a slow pace, I'll try as best I can. And the last thing that I want to leave you guys with is if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like in the description below. And I will work on the next episode as soon as this video gets to 250 likes. I know that is very, very high amount but I'm using that kind of as a buffer just so in the meantime I know that I'll be slowing down a lot it hopefully that allows me to have enough time to catch up and work on this before I need to actually ship it out and once again I'd like to thank everyone so so much for your constant support and viewership hopefully that continues on and I will try to push out more history of Yu-Gi-Oh because I know that's what a lot of you are here for thank you so much and I will see you guys again